A happy media new year to all. The day after Labor Day, it is the start of the media season when all the television shows would begin when I was a kid. So it is an important day, at least in North America. Hello and welcome back to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, where the excitement never stops in our discussion on natural resources. And it's quite interesting as I go out to social events. Back in the teens, you know, back pre, let's even say pre-COVID, when you mentioned you were in mining at a party, at social events, wherever, it wasn't necessarily seen as particularly glamorous. But I am starting to see that change. I think people's ears are perking up. They understand, listen, these are pretty interesting things that affect our world. So the narrative around mining, there is no question it is evolving and changing. And that is, you know, one of the surprising things I'd argue about getting older. The world does change over time. And it feels like nothing's happening in the micro, but as you zoom out, you do notice all sorts of things have changed in the world in the last, you know, 15 years. I mean, look at work from home, just as one of many examples. Look at, you know, there's weed stocks now, there's psychedelic stocks now. That would have been unthinkable in, you know, 2005 or six. I mean, people were being put away for those things now. They are public companies. So all very interesting. As we take a look now at the last week's developments, of course, we had the coup in Gabon. And this is, you know, kind of one of those weird, I, do we call it a double standard? I mean, we're not seeing the same attention being placed on the coup in Gabon as the one in Niger. You know, we're not hearing about Victoria Newland flying in, and maybe she is, and I just haven't heard about it, but I just feel like we're not getting the same sort of outcry and concern as that we saw in Niger. So we can, from that, triangulate the geopolitical importance of Niger, relatively speaking. Nevertheless, I did a search in ChatGPT as to what Gabon, what the geopolitical importance is, and what its natural resource production is, and it is oil. From the sounds of it, it sounds like although the production is considered modest at 200 to 250,000 barrels a day, it is a centerpiece of the economy over there. Now, a couple of things to note on that. I mean, we saw that with the BRICS, they had surrounded the Persian Gulf in the form of Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. We also speculated that perhaps the choke points of Egypt moving, you know, oil and natural gas from the Middle East through the Suez Canal, which is controlled by Egypt, into the Mediterranean to Europe, that also was added to the BRICS, and also Ethiopia, which arguably is a route for getting energy into the continent of Africa. So, speculatively speaking, a real focus on energy there. Now, Another thing that we've noted is how these coups tend to be aligning with each other. We saw Burkina Faso and Mali offer war support, an alliance of sorts with Niger, should it be attacked by ECOWAS or anybody else. And so we have another coup here with Gabon. And interestingly, I would say, although it's a small, you know, as ChatGPT was saying, a modest oil producer at 200 to 250,000 barrels a day, you know, that arguably is flipping over into the, you know, Russian side of things or the BRICS side of things. Because as we know, most of these juntas, these military governments that were installed by coups, most of them, if not, you know, the three that we can think of there seem pretty friendly with Russia. And one wonders if we were to look at this as a kind of chessboard, as crass as that might seem, I would argue. But nevertheless, if we were to abstract and see Gabon is a chess piece, one would argue potentially it has flipped over onto the other side. And it's kind of like this constant drip, drip, drip of less and less resources available to the West, you might say from friendly countries. Now, another perhaps even more important side, other than the oil, although I think the oil is significant. I mean, if 250,000 barrels a day were taken off the market, 
I think that matters these days. It sounds like it's very tight. It's a very complicated market, so I'm not going to attempt to say anything more than that. But another really interesting aspect is manganese. Gabon produces, according to ChatGPT in 2021, Gabon produces 25% of the world's manganese. And manganese is a major ingredient for not only stainless steel, but let me just bring it up here. Quite fascinatingly, of battery technology, manganese dioxide is used as a cathode material in alkaline zinc carbon and lithium ion batteries, and also for aluminum alloys. So on its own, maybe this doesn't seem like a huge deal, but when you just keep adding up before it was the uranium in Niger, then it's the germanium and gallium that uh, China is cutting off. And so to me, taking a step back, it just seems increasingly the West seems to be in an increasingly precarious position in regard to its natural resources. So we have been sounding the alarm bell. Uh, we had a great interview last week on how U.S. policy could improve in order to encourage mining in local jurisdictions and what might be required. And so we're trying to do our part over here to help inform the public in this regard. So that is Gabon. There's also on this whole BRICS issue, it's quite significant, it seems to me, that President Xi is not attending the G20. So both the heads of state of Russia and China are not attending the G20, which is going to be hosted in India. So again, one can't help but feel that this is somewhat of a blow to the G20. So also worth mentioning and just looking at the oil price to put a number here for you on the oil price. I mean, it was up at $89 earlier today. Brent crude. So it keeps on moving higher. Let's just put it that way. Right now it's at $88.52, turning over to West Texas Intermediate. Again, oil took a bit of a break there for a few days, and now it's right back at $85.51 for WTI per barrel. So oil market continues to look constrained. And of course, the US no longer has the strategic petroleum reserves available, or not in the same quantity. It looks like it was about half sold off, just going from memory from charts, so don't take that to the bank. So all very interesting as we begin, again, this Media New Year. So if you want to get more involved in the mining industry, it never hurts to have a face-to-face, and that's why you may want to go to this year's Canadian Mining Symposium in London, England, on October 12th and 13th. Simply go to events.northernminer.com and let me tell you who's going to be there. Robert Friedland, founder and executive co-chair of Ivanhoe Mines. Catherine McLeod Seltzer, independent chair of Kinross Gold. David Garofalo, CEO, president, chairman, and director of Gold Royalty. Frank Justra, strategic advisor at Eris Mining. Don Lindsay, former CEO of Tech Resources. John A. McCluskey, president, CEO, and director at Alamo Gold. Sean Rusin, Chair of the Board of Directors at Cisco Gold Royalties, and Randy Smallwood, President and CEO at Wheaton Precious Metals, as well as several presentations. So it is going to be a wonderful networking event if you want to get up close and personal with this vital industry that is playing an increasingly important role in how our world evolves. So a very exciting event indeed. Coming up, I'm very pleased to welcome back Cam Curry, strategic advisor at Canaccord Genuity for another fantastic interview. We interviewed him at the start of the summer. Now we are bookending it with another interview at the end of the summer with Cam's view on gold stocks and investing in gold versus the metal. Also his views on the precious metals versus the industrial metals as well as his views on the BRICS meeting that took place in August. It's an awesome interview, as always, with his emphasis on narrative economics, one of my favorite ways of looking at these markets and at what is going on really in the world. And you know why I like it so much? Because it is all narrative at the end of the day, so it is the most universal way of dealing with all of these variables that we are given. 
It is all narrative. So we are very lucky to have Cam Curry back with some pressing insights on what is happening in this larger world and what the opportunities might be. Coming up on this week's CEO Spotlight, I'm very pleased to welcome Michael A. Connert, President and CEO of Vizla Silver, and he is going to discuss the company's Panuco project in Mexico. It sounds like a wonderful silver deposit with a lot of opportunities. You're going to want to listen to this and more. So a great show ahead for you, my friends, as we begin this fascinating new year together here on the Northern Miner podcast. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts. And wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's join Michael Connert, President and CEO of Vizla Silver, for this week's CEO Spotlight. Joining us today, I am very pleased to welcome Michael Connert, President and CEO of Vizla Silver for this week's CEO Spotlight. Michael, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Adrian. I appreciate that. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you. And, you know, Vizla Silver is one of those companies that I have heard about here and there, and I have seen it, I feel like, over the years. For those that may not be familiar, who is Vizla Silver? What are you up to? So Vizla Silver is a group of leading professionals and a very strong board. And, you know, we all came together through Vizla Silver, really with the vision to create a company that took an asset from exploration through development into production. And really our goal here is to create one of the world's leading single asset silver producers with our Panuco district. So we're an energetic team, we're a motivated team, and we have an incredible platform with our Panuco project. Okay, excellent. And the Panuco project, that is based in Mexico, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's an interesting project. It's a little different than, you know, most companies out there in the sense that, you know, I actually spent about a year in Mexico working on acquiring these two halves of this district. And this district dates back, you know, 450 years it really looks like an analog to San Dimas, which some listeners may know that is the uh, you know the main asset for First Majestic. It's also the asset that really built Gold Corp and and then the stream that built Silver Wheaton. So, you know, we have what I believe is an asset that that's directly comparable to San Dimas, but we consolidated it for the first time and uh, we're the first group to uh, systematically explore that. And because of that, we have you know, a very large district with excellent infrastructure, but brand new grass field discoveries in a brownfields district. And right now we have the world's largest undeveloped high grade silver resource, and it's only getting bigger. We expect there to be an updated resource towards the end of the year, economics to follow. And, you know, we're going to use that really to drive this project into production and create a very large silver producer. I love the ambition. Sounds like you guys are pretty excited to take this the full way. Then just to clarify then, so how far along is this? You've drilled, you've found stuff, you know something's there. Like, where are we in your project here? Well, really, you know, we're, we're essentially four years into, well, I suppose, you know, four years into knowing about the the project in a way, you know, it took a while to to acquire it in the first year. And we really started drilling in earnest in 2020, you know, of course, which was interrupted by various shutdowns along the way. But despite that, you know, from 2020 till, you know, the beginning of this year, you know, we drilled off uh, over 220 million ounces of silver equivalent in indicated and inferred combined. You know, we're expecting substantial growth from that, you know, in this updated resource. So we have, you know, very large resource that's not only growing, but also converting into indicated as well. But really the next steps for us here the next year is going to be taking that resource and moving it through the economic study gates there and ensuring that we have really a robust project that can move very rapidly into production. So we're at the advanced exploration stage, moving into studies. But in Mexico, and certainly at our project here, which by the way is an hour away from the city of Mazatlan on the coast, you know, there's there's a highway that connects the city of Durango and the city of Mazatlan. And we're kind of smack in the middle of that, you know, off of uh, off of two main highways, really, that run through the property, has excellent 
power infrastructure, excellent water infrastructure. We're very, very blessed. This is almost a sidewalk mining project in, the, in that sense. And because of that, and because of the brownfields nature of the district, you know, we have the ability to move this very, very rapidly into production. There's, you know, 35 kilometers of underground workings that exist at the project already. You know, there's uh, there's a talented workforce. Most of the communities there works for us already. So, you know, the way that we see this is that, you know, although we're at advanced exploration stage, you know, we can move very rapidly into production. Okay, excellent. And Mexico is silver country, as a lot of us in the mining industry know. So I guess I have a couple of questions on that. I mean, they had recent legislation. I think it had to do with, wasn't quite property rights, but staking rights and this sort of thing. So how do you feel in terms like, are you basically grandfathered in or how are you feeling on that whole situation with just the government and, and even the community, if you can add on that? Well, you know, maybe I'll start with the community. So we're we're fortunate that the the region that we work in, you know, despite us being in the state of Sinaloa and, and Sinaloa not being as well known as say Durango or Sonora or Chihuahua in the mining industry, you know, it has a very strong, you know, local mining industry. And so there's a lot of mining history there, a lot of very experienced underground miners in that area. And because of that, you know, our work has been quite well accepted and, and we have four 30-year ahito agreements with the local groups there in our in our district. You know, we have five ahitos, the, the final fifth ahito we expect to sign shortly, but also, you know, we have long-term exploration agreements with that ahito. So, you know, we're well accepted into this this area. It's an area that knows mining. You know, it's an area that I, I expect to embrace this mine as we move forward. And, and I was actually just down there two weeks ago meeting with the, the state government of, of Sinaloa very, very supportive of what we're doing. We've actually created the most uh, high paying jobs out, out of all municipalities and the most new jobs out of all municipalities in the state of Sinaloa. So, you know, we're creating a lot of value for the state, the communities that we work in, and also for, for Mexico as a, as a whole. So as that feeds into that mining reform, the mining reform I think is centered, you know, I think, I suppose it could be well-intentioned you know, the tactics that they've taken to to do some things, you know, I, I, I leave me a little bit scratching my head, but I suspect that, you know, we'll be able to permit and move this project into production. Even in this current regime, you know, the last two projects that have done that are Silvercrest and Meg, you know, and the administration of AMLO. So, you know, I think it's possible, you know, the reform, I think, is more focused on exploration versus, you know, existing grandfather licenses like we have here. Perhaps the trickier part might be the the actual permitting through Semernet, but you know I think we have a you know very good support by the state, very good support by our communities. I expect us to be able to move this into production and create a lot of value for the communities that we work in. Yeah, absolutely. It's always a balancing act from the governmental point of view because you don't want to scare off the miners either. And silver, I mean, a lot of people are excited about. And so tell us then. As we move forward, then, uh, what do we have to look forward to? Why should investors be excited about Vizsla Silver? What's coming next? And you touched on it there as well, you know, silver. You know, we have the world's largest undeveloped high-grade silver resource, you know, now at, at a time where the world needs more silver. The world needs more silver for photovoltaics, for electric vehicles, you know, really to meet any decarbonization goals that uh, that the world may have. You know, that are aggressive goals that that really can't be achieved without the metals, you know, the metals that we find and are soon to mine. So I think that the demand for silver is going to be voracious in the coming months and years here. I'm surprised at the price level now, although it is a it's, it's a fine price level to be to be mining silver at and, and making money. But I suspect that silver is going to have its day in the sun. And as a result of that, I, I think these high quality tier one assets like we have here at Panuco are going to be very, very valuable. Right now, it's 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 incredibly undervalued. You know, this this market has created a, a huge disparity between the intrinsic value of, of assets and then the, the value that you can buy on the stock exchange. And, you know, as a result, our insiders, that you know, the, the team behind Visa, we have been buying the stock on the open market. We think it's undervalued. I'll probably buy some more stock here shortly out of the market when I'm able to. And, you know, I think this is you have an opportunity to buy something that's, uh, that's trading at dimes, you know, it's worth dollars. So, you know, I think that's why investors should be excited about Visa Silver. It sounds exciting indeed. And just finally then, so is it going to be the PEA, the Preliminary Economic Assessment next, or what's the roadmap, I guess, as we go forward? 
we've been working very hard towards an updated resource statement, which will be our third resource statement. You know, that should come out, you know, I would think probably, you know, maybe ready by the end of the year. It may come out at you know, the beginning of, of this coming year. It'll likely be probably very either very close to the PEA or it may even be, uh, you know, PEA may encompass that resource update. But basically, you know, in, in, in the early part of next year, I think what we want to do is really kind of frame Visla Silver as, you know, moving from ad advanced exploration into, into development. And the way that we would do that was exactly right. You know, the PEA is going to be key for us there. So that's really the, you know, the resource update, the PEA, those are kind of our big targets here going into 2024. Michael Connert, President and CEO of Visla Silver, thank you for joining us on this week's CEO Spotlight. Thank you very much, Adrian. And a big thank you and shout out to Michael Connert, President and CEO of Visla Silver, for sponsoring this week's episode of the Northern Miner podcast. Turning to the website, Aramet to resume manganese mining in Gabon after coup. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Aramet will restart production at its manganese mining operations in Gabon on Thursday, ending a temporary halt in the wake of the military coup in the country. The Paris-based miner said late Wednesday it has decided to resume mining operations after monitoring events in the country after announcing earlier in the day that it would halt activity as a precautionary measure. Shares of Aramet, which has been expanding its key Moanda mine, slumped as much as 22% in Paris. While Gabon is better known as an oil producer, Aramet has been investing heavily in expanding manganese output in recent years. That's helped the former French colony become the world's number two supplier of the metal, which is a key ingredient in steelmaking and is finding growing usage in electric vehicle batteries. So ChatGPT is pretty on point here. Continuing on, manganese is one of the world's most abundant mined elements, but production is concentrated in a handful of countries, including South Africa. Gabon, Australia, and China. And again, South Africa, we could say, is part of BRICS. I mean, not necessarily against the West, but, you know, nevertheless, I mean, it's Australia is kind of the main sure play here from the West's point of view. Aramet said last month that the global market was in a slight surplus in the first half of the year, but there are growing concerns about supply risks surrounding high purity forms of the metal that are needed by battery makers. Earlier this year, the European Commission proposed designating battery-grade manganese as a strategic raw material, alongside other metals like copper and nickel that play a key role in the energy transition. Gabon's manganese assets are a major source of revenue and employment for the state. Aramit paid more than 132 million euros in taxes and dividends in 2022, and spent more than 407 million euros on local purchases and subcontracting. The company directly employs 8,767 people, it said in a report in June. Aramet said it will continue to monitor the situation in Gabon closely. It also said it will immediately restart rail transport activity while passenger train movements will remain suspended. So interesting that it's more French interests in Gabon. And continuing on, Lithium Miner says Mali stops direct shipping ore operations. And again, one wonders if this is next for a place like Gabon. So this is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Australian miner Leo Lithium said Mali has suspended operations of unrefined lithium ore from its Gula Mina project, a joint venture with China's Ganfang Lithium Group. So an important thing to observe here, this is unrefined lithium. So this is back to that narrative which we saw way back in probably last October in Indonesia when they were saying, you know, we want the supply chain to be in our countries. It sounds like refined lithium is fine to export. It's the unrefined lithium, the raw ore. They want their place in the supply chain and to be able to take advantage of the money beyond just selling ore to the West. Crushing of direct shipping ore, an unprocessed form of the material, has been immediately stopped while discussions with Mali's Ministry of Mines are pending, according to a filing to Australia's stock exchange. Leo Lithium plummeted more than 50% on Monday, its first day of trading since halting mid-July. So it is pretty interesting, and actually they're going to get to Barrick here, which I was going to mention. The Australian miner said the suspension won't delay, quote, any aspect of this project, end quote, and the first spot you mean concentrate production remains on schedule for the second quarter of 2024, 
Quote, mining continues as per the pre-existing plan and mined ore is being stockpiled, end quote. Gula Mina is set to become the first producing lithium project in Mali, which is home to some of the largest gold mines in Africa, run by companies including Barrick Gold and B2 Gold Corp. The asset is one of the largest resources of lithium-bearing spodumene under development at a time when demand for the battery metal is surging. And we have a quote from Abdullaya Pona, the president of Mali's Chamber of Mines, who said by phone, quote, We strongly recommend that it's not good that our gold, that our resources, leave the country without being transformed on the spot. So a common refrain now from many countries in the global south. This was quite fascinating. Europe's top copper producer, Aurubus, hit by a huge metal scam. And this is massive. Bloomberg News via mining.com. I mean, it's a weird trend we're seeing in the mining news. We saw two nickel scams, and now we're seeing a massive copper scam. Europe's top copper producer, Arubus, warned it may face losses in the hundreds of millions of euros after being hit by a massive scam involving shipments of scrap metal that it uses in its recycling business. Shares in the company plunged as much as 18% after it announced it found a significant metal shortfall and said it no longer expects to meet its profit forecast for the year. Arubus believes some of its suppliers have manipulated details about the scrap metal they provided and had been working with employees in the company's sampling department to cover it up. The scam, announced late Thursday, relates to material purchased for Arubus's metal recycling business. In addition to raw material from mines, the company also buys huge volumes of copper-bearing scrap from near-new manufacturing offcuts to old cables, pipes, and electronic circuit boards. It processes thousands of tons of these materials every day to produce refined metal. So, pretty interesting over there. And we've been following Cadelco. Cadelco put under review by Moody's with debt piling up Bloomberg News. So the bad news continues with Cadelco here. Cadelco is facing the possibility of a credit rating cut as slumping production, rising costs, and project disruptions dim leverage metrics as the world's biggest copper supplier. Moody's Investor Services placed Cadelco ratings under review for downgrade, the firm said in a statement Tuesday, citing major operational challenges and structural decline in ore grades. Moody's rates Cadelco A3, its fourth lowest investment grade. And we have a quote from Moody's that said, quote, The review for downgrade reflects the likelihood that production volumes will not materially improve in the short term and will remain below historical levels in the next 12 to 18 months, which will weigh on Cadelco's profitability, leverage, and coverage metrics. So if you don't have the copper, you don't have the copper, is how it's starting to look over there. Continuing on, China zooms in on Latin America, Africa in critical minerals race, says report. This is Jackson Chen on the Northern Miner. Facing more restrictive foreign investment policies in developed markets, China is expected to continue building its influence over key minerals such as lithium and cobalt across the developing world, according to S&P Global. In a recent report, the U.S. data analytics firm stated that, quote, China's reach is quietly growing behind minerals critical to a wide range of products that will shape the future, end quote, with firms from upstream to downstream, from miners to battery makers to electric vehicle manufacturers all jumping into this race. Quote, whether related to top-line growth, cost control, supply security, or backward integration, their motivations are compelling and are likely to last beyond temporary dips in these minerals' prices, S&P stated. So China is not letting up in their investment. Continuing on, Zijin Mining slows M&A on valuations and geopolitical risks. This is Bloomberg News. Via mining.com, Zijin Mining Group, a leading Chinese copper and gold miner, has slowed acquisitions due to high project valuations and geopolitical tensions. The number and scale of deals completed by the company is fewer than previous years, although it's still, quote, actively looking for merger and acquisition opportunities generally, end quote, President Zhu Kang told investors at a briefing on Wednesday following the company's first half results. And continuing on, Hyundai to invest $400 million for stake in Korea Zinc. So more automobile manufacturers entering the mining business. Bloomberg News via mining.com, Hyundai Motor Group will buy a 5% stake in Korea Zinc, the world's largest smelter for non-ferrous metals, as part of its effort to ensure access to key metals used in making electric car batteries. The group, which controls Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis brands, signed a partnership Wednesday with the smelter to jointly develop a, quote, nickel value chain, end quote, 
that procures, processes, and recycles the metal needed for EV batteries, the Seoul-based automaker said in an emailed statement. Hyundai will spend $398 million to purchase shares of Korea Zinc as part of the tie-up, it said. I mean, $400 million. Shows how serious this uh, resource situation really is. Hyundai plans to buy 50% of the nickel it needs for EV batteries through the partnership by 2031 to comply with President Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which encourages car makers to produce EV components outside of China. The supply chain built with Korea Zinc, also based in Seoul, will meet European requirements for the sourcing of critical minerals and satisfy other ESG rules, the automaker said. It aims to be one of the world's top three EV makers by the end of this decade by producing 3.64 million vehicles annually. So more vehicles for the road, everybody. Something to look forward to. And continuing on, this is Henry Lazenby at the Northern Miner. U.S. Inflation Reduction Act lays bare critical mineral supply fault lines, says report. If we take a look here, the Inflation Reduction Act is reshaping the landscape of metals and minerals demand, triggering a surge in critical minerals activity while structural permitting challenges in the U.S. legal system could thwart the act's efficacy, new analysis by S&P Global shows. And we were just discussing this with Satish Rao of Clario last week. In its Inflation Reduction Act Impact on North America Metals and Minerals Market Report, released Thursday, market analysts highlight sourcing and production challenges as well as complications in navigating the permitting system. Quote, the complex U.S. landscape holds a pivotal role in operational success, influencing project timelines and feasibility, and quote, wrote the report's project chairman, Daniel Juergen, vice chairman of S&P Global. He continues, quote, prolonged permitting processes and the specter of potential post-permit litigation risks presents formidable challenges across mining and refining countries. As the industry grapples with this multifaceted challenge, operational concerns stand out as a defining factor shaping domestic production prospects. So pretty interesting over there. And a column from Reuters, just a headline here, South Korea's Gwanyang is the new LME aluminum battleground, Reuters via mining.com. And it says here that South Korean's port of Gwanyang has emerged as the new hub for storing LME aluminum. LME registered warehouses in the city currently hold 256,000 metric tons of aluminum, accounting for 49% of all the light metal sitting in the exchange's global warehouse network. So 50% or 49% of the aluminum at the LME is stored in South Korea. Kind of interesting there. And one final one here, quite an interesting story in the diamond market. Diamond prices are in free fall in one key corner of the market. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. One of the world's most popular types of rough diamonds has plunged into a pricing freefall as an increasing number of Americans choose engagement rings made from lab-grown stones instead. Now this seemed entirely predictable years ago when we were discussing how badly does the average person need a non-lab-grown diamond. Diamond demand across the board has weakened after the pandemic as consumers splash out again on travel and experiences while economic headwinds eat into luxury spending. However, the kinds of stones that go into the cheaper one or two carat solitaire bridal rings popular in the U.S. have experienced far sharper price drops than the rest of the market. And again, we've been talking about this since like, I feel like 2019. I remember at PDAC, this was kind of a big conversation. The reason, according to industry insiders, is soaring demand for lab-grown stones. The synthetic diamond industry has paid special attention to this category, where consumers are especially price-sensitive, and the efforts are now paying off in the world's biggest diamond buyer. So, pretty fascinating over in the diamond market. Seemed like just a matter of time, but we shall see. So, those are your news stories. Now, let's take a look at metal prices. And turning to metal prices, let's just take a quick look at the U.S. 10-year bond. As we like to do here, it is yielding 4.226%. So that is 0.01% higher than last week. So edging just slightly higher in the U.S. 10-year bond yield. Looking at the U.K. 10-year bond, it is yielding 4.5%. That is 0.04% higher 
And Italy, just for context, is yielding 4.33%, and that is 0.12% higher. So Italy up a little higher than UK, and then US barely edges higher. Turning to our precious metals, gold is trading at $1,955.40 per ounce. That is $8 higher than last week. Silver is trading at $24.03 per ounce. That is $0.30 cents lower than last week. Platinum is trading at $952.83 per ounce. That is $11 lower than last week. And palladium is also lower at $1,221.05 per ounce. That is $32 lower than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is $0.04 cents higher at $3.80 per pound. Iron ore is also higher at $118.19 per metric ton. That is $10 higher than last week. Aluminum is also higher at $1 per pound. That is two cents higher than last week. Lead is four cents higher at $1.03 per pound. Nickel is also higher at $9.48 per pound. That is 13 cents higher than last week. Tin is higher at $11.71 per pound. That is $0.14 cents higher than last week. Cobalt is unchanged at $15.16 per pound. Lithium is lower at $27.72 per kilogram. That is $2 lower than last week. Uranium is edging slightly higher at $58.50 per pound. That is $0.25 cents higher than last week. Continuing its very gentle upward climb. And finally, zinc is trading at $1.13 per pound. That is $0.05 cents higher than last week. So zooming out, I would say industrial metals higher, precious metals generally lower, except for gold, which is slightly higher. So precious metals edging sideways to lower generally, and industrial metals up. And those are your metal prices. Coming up, I'm very pleased to welcome back Cam Curry, Senior Investment Advisor for Canaccord Genuity, back to the Northern Miner podcast. We discuss all things precious metals, stocks, gold, all the different narratives in the markets, including how gold is awaiting a new narrative. And once it shifts, we should see fireworks, according to Cam Curry. He's very excited about the gold stocks, even more so than the copper stocks, which he says are higher, relatively speaking. So a very interesting interview here as Cam likes to look at things primarily from the narrative point of view, which makes us a huge fan over here at the Northern Miner Podcast. I hope you enjoy it and I will see you on the other side. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome back Panacord Genuity Senior Investment Advisor Cam Curry to the Northern Miner Podcast. Last time was super interesting. Cam, welcome back to the show. Adrian, thanks for having me back. Well, it's great to have you. I first talked to you back in May, and we had a very fascinating discussion on macroeconomics, gold. So I'm thrilled to have you back, bookending the summer. So from your perspective, very big picture, what is on your radar right now? What are you thinking about that has kind of got you most interested right now? Well, it's a multifaceted question. I think the most interesting thing is gold's now trading at 1975, only about $50 from its all-time high or $75 from its all-time high. Yet we've had this drift off in the, uh, the gold equities. And it's quite interesting because what we're seeing is these algos that are driving these equities down. And I think part of it is, is just we're in one of those pockets again where the money flows are chasing the shiny objects of U.S. equities. I mean, I'll give you an example. Carvana, which was one of the um, disruptive companies in the United States that, I don't know if you know of it, they do kiosks for selling uh, used cars and that. And the stock was IPO'd and went to $200 a share, bombed out at $3 a share a few months ago. Apollo Funds came in and did a convertible debenture when it was right, right around $17, $18. Well, all of a sudden, since it was $3, it's now trading at $52 a share because Apollo restructured some of their debt. And there's a belief that perhaps, you know, there's going to be a resurgence of uh, used car sales. And so when you have price movements like that, and by the way, I still think that company technically will one day will go under. But when you see price movements like that, 
it attracts the, the investors. And so the investor of today is still looking for rate of change in, in stocks. And these algos are constantly you know, chomping these things up. I mean, look at BlackRock, for example. All of a sudden, they're going to launch an ETF on uh, Bitcoin. All of a sudden, Bitcoin goes from eighteen to twenty-seven thousand dollars. Coinbase MicroStrategies took off, and then yesterday, the decision with Grayscale's ETF to, to be approved, they took off again. And yet, the valuation matrix on these stocks don't really can't make any sense. It's all about the narrative. And so, every day, it seems like two tons sold, five tons sold in the gold ETFs in the United States. So, the U.S. investor isn't paying attention to the fact that gold's near its high, and the stocks just keep on drifting off. And it's almost like a pocketism. So. You know, I'm fully of the opinion when gold goes up through 2000 this time for the reason of the U.S. dollar continuing its downward turn, there's a real, real pocket of uh, opportunity in terms of rebates in these gold stocks. So that's really on my mind. And it's trying to convince people now to step in with these stocks off 20, 30 percent. It's tough to buy them when things are going down. But of course, that's the best time to buy. It's really interesting, your observation on the nature of the stock market. It does feel like, I think someone called it like an echo bubble of 2021. Like there is a sense of this kind of, there is a kind of very speculative aspect. Ironically, after last year's kind of terrible year, it's kind of come back, as you said, with these almost like meme type stocks. You know, you see Carvana go from three to 52. I hadn't heard that. That's incredible. Yeah. And meanwhile, it feels like the reason the gold stocks aren't performing is because they're not performing. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's almost like, well, people gave gold a chance and it didn't go anywhere. So it's just like enough with this gold thing because it's not going anywhere. But maybe once it does... So you see a big opportunity in the gold stocks. Absolutely. And again, I, I think I mentioned last time in my interview that if you look at the market cap of all the gold companies in the world, the market cap is less than Home Depot. So it's a very, very, very small market. And so in a lot of ways, it's not even on the radar of investors. And, you know, I think, again, the narrative is going to be what's going to be the shift of money flows going into the ETF. So it then fly into the equities. And we just don't have any of that right now, despite the fact that gold is near its all-time highs. Because correct me if I'm wrong, outside of NVIDIA and Apple and a couple of the, uh, Microsoft, I mean, how many how many sectors are trading near all-time highs? And I think it's beautifully put, how you put it. The It is trading at its all-time highs, but from a narrative perspective, it feels like a letdown because it you know didn't take off, I guess, in the last breakout when it was above 2100. And probably a lot of people started piling in. And now it's only down at 1975 but as you rightly point out it's near its all-time highs so if anything it seems that gold has a bit of a narrative problem but as we know this is the gas the fuel perhaps for the next bull market is this kind of lousy sentiment you know that's exactly it and again you know prior to us turning on the recording you and i were talking about the fact that you know in march we had silicon valley and first republic okay the regional banks and that's a, a memory from a long time ago. The market seems to have forgotten about that, despite the fact that Congress is now looking at uh, uh, getting regional banks below a certain um, market cap, having to put aside a contingency in case of, uh, of, of financial risk, which again, if you do that, then you take that money out of circulation, which tightens up the credit lending of, of the banks, which puts greater duress on the lending practice to small businesses and commercial real estate, which again, I think is in the early stages of, of its bear market. The one thing that, again, if I could touch upon Adrian, is that one of the things that no one ever talks about anymore is the fact that in 10 years, when we had free money, global debt went from 200 to $300 trillion. And during the period of 2020 to 2023, the US dollar money supply went from 4 trillion to 14 trillion with all the QE. So you had free money, you had massive liquidification in the system that went into assets. Now you've got you know, um, interest rates, in essence, 20 year highs in the United States. Look at what's happened in Germany with your interest rates. So the weight or the burden of debt has gotten very expensive. And yet, we haven't seen any repercussions of that yet because again there's so much liquidity in the system and people have got so used to going okay we've been through this before you know it's, it's transient in terms of slowdown and they aren't looking at the real picture of the risk coming forward i mean this u.s savings function when COVID hit was at two trillion dollars i listened to an interview by a very successful big real estate developer yesterday and he was saying the savings function now is about 180 billion 
So inflation at higher rates is basically, you know, starting to really you know, impact the consumer. And we're seeing that a lot of retail sales numbers, Dollar Tree today down down 15%. Dick's Sporting's good down 30% uh, last week because the consumer is getting tapped out. So we see this recession ensuing. When that happens, I think, you know, the U.S. dollar will resume its downward slide. And that's when I think gold is really going to start getting the attention. Yeah, very interesting. So you see a recession on the horizon. I mean, it's hard, you know, as I've discussed in this podcast in previous weeks, like my inner bear is still alive and well. And frankly, that downdraft we saw in August, it seemed to give a little bit more oxygen because as the market continued higher, it was getting harder and harder to maintain a bearish stance. But so you do have a view that there is a recession on the horizon. Again, I just don't see how there can't be one. I mean, you had free money for 10 years, you had mispriced assets, and you had two very bad behaviors happening. People were overpaying for assets, be it houses, bonds, or stocks, and they were over leveraging with free money to do that. And now you've seen the whipsaw, but the asset prices haven't come down to the point where there's a concern about the stress point, despite Silicon Valley's and that. And so, you know, I think in the next couple of quarters, the data, I mean, you still have an inverted yield curve, all the indicators are suggesting that we're going to have a recession. Now, let's just say the economy takes off again. Well, then you've got a major inflation problem. So uh, they're kind of stuck. I don't know. I, to, to me, it just I'm, I'm absolutely shocked. But again, I'm a very conservative person. I don't care any debt. And I just look at, you know, how the consumer is maintaining themselves in this environment. And clearly they're not because you, you're starting to hear it. Now, it's taking longer than I thought for them to adjust their consumption function habits. But when you see the indexes trading all-time highs or near all-time highs and NVIDIA is going to $500, everyone thinks everything's fine. But if you look under the hood, Disney's trading almost new lows here. I mean, theme park visitations in the United States are near lows. You start looking at the real indications. The auto stocks are trading to their lows. AT&T and, and Verizon, you know, they're trading to their new lows. So there's a very few pocket of companies that are actually driving the indexes. And it's misleading investor, in my view. So if we turn to silver then, I mean, silver's kind of a interesting beast in the sense that it has, you know, this dual function. It's both a precious metal, but it's also an industrial metal. And we've seen some pretty impressive price action on silver. I think it's been like outperforming gold in the last, say, week or two. What are your thoughts on silver within this larger context? Well, I love silver. The only thing is there's not a lot of silver plays, pure plays. It's a byproduct. But you know, as I say that, that's one of the things that is very, very attractive about silver is the supply side issue going forward. I mean, we all know the supply side issue of copper going forward. I'm very bullish on copper long term. Short term, I'm, I'm neutral a little bit because I think the narrative of recession is going to, you know, put pressure on, on copper prices and that'll create the last buying dip before we take off. But silver, you know, the supply side issue is going to be significant because a lot of these big projects aren't being built. That's where the byproduct comes from. And silver, as you know, is it's the poor man's gold in essence. And so as gold as a tangible goes up, silver will as well. But the industrial use of it is significant. It, it, it's an EV metal. And the narrative eventually will come into it. I mean, I think breakout at $27 and you, and you go all in because I think silver then is starting to show its move. But again, there's very few ways of playing silver, right? So on that point, then, I think I remember last time we talked, your emphasis was more on the stocks over the metals. Is that still the case? Absolutely. Because again, the leverage, I'm not paid just by commodities. You know, people can buy commodities uh, through any other means. My job is to try to find companies that are going to outperform their peers in the metals uh, space. And those are companies that are unlocking value. And, uh, and that, that's my wheelhouse. I mean, I'm looking for those companies that are you know, that are going to be the in the gold price going from 100 to three to 500,000 ounce production. Because the M&A, that's the one thing about this space is the value discrepancy between some of the mid tiers and the developers is so extreme right now. I mean, you're getting 0.8 times NAV on some of these half million ounce producers, yet the 100, 200,000 ounce producers are marching towards that under construction are trading at 0.2 times NAV. And we don't want to see M&A starting now because these things are just way too cheap. But mm -hmm. as they get re-rated, as they move into that space, as they unlock the values of their development, that's the wheelhouse I like to I like to invest in. 
Now, in terms of, I, I don't know if you're involved in like the financing of some of these exploration, I guess maybe you're more mid-tier focused, but tell me what you think of this whole subject of financings, because I talked to Stephen Stewart, say a few weeks ago, and he was saying, you know, in Canada, the financing for, like, they're desperate, a lot of these exploration companies. Then I talked to our Western editor, Henry Lazenby, who was in in Tonopah, which is kind of making a bit of a comeback, apparently. And he said it wasn't so bad in the U.S., like, in a sense, the financings of these exploration companies. So what is your view or perspective on these financings of these small to mid-tier mining companies? And how does that factor into everything for you? Well, the financing window right now is, in essence, a little too great closed. Let's look at the junior, junior exploration companies. I mean, they're all running on ether right now. I mean, a million dollars is going to keep the lights on without putting anything into the ground. And so a lot of these companies are sitting there going, okay, how are we going to raise money at, at our share price where it is and put money into the ground to unlock the value of what we think? I mean, you can be buying some of these companies. I've got one company in particular, you know, a 275,000 ounce producer, has $85 million US in the bank, just earned $35 million last quarter, and they have growth. And the stock's trading at five times PE multiple. And the company's called Caliber in, in, in Nicaragua and run by a tier one management team. And so why would you go down to the junior, junior explorers when you buy such great value in a, in a company like that? And that's the problem. You know, when the money flows come back in, they're going to go into the seniors, the mid-tiers, the developers, and then the juniors will get the flow as people get more confidence. That's just the way our money flows work. But, you know, you can be buying some of the senior producers right now with three, 4% dividend yields. And again, one of the things that Adrian, I want to point out is Canada is one of the, Canada, Australia, are the two mining capitals of the world. And, and Canada, I'd say, is probably the biggest because it's uh, proximity to the United States. And very few people do what I do in our country now because they've left the sectors. They've gone, they previously they chased cannabis and they chased crypto, they chased all these other technologies in the States. And so the investor interest in the space has basically moved on. And that's why I'm so optimistic about the opportunity because no one's paying attention. And it kind of reminds me back in 2002 when no one was paying attention. And then 2003 came along, the US dollar started really rolling over. Gold went up through 400 and the rest is history. And I just want to mention on that note, I mean, you know, everyone talks about gold as a relic and it's archaic, but you know, gold is one of the top three reserve currencies in the world. The other two are the Euro and the US dollar. And, you know, I asked the audience, if you go back to 2000, when the dollar was a dollar and gold was at $300 an ounce. What's the purchasing power of those assets today? You know, gold in 1975, what would your dollar of 2000 buy you today? And yet no one looks at the asset class in North America from that perspective. And yet all these Eastern central banks are continuing to buy gold as a reserve currency because they're seeing the concerns about what's going on with the US dollar. And I wanna go there after just one more question on the precious metal stocks. In terms of valuations, like it seemed like we hit kind of a low of sorts in the metals in 2016. And comparing those valuations then with the valuations in precious metals or just metal stocks that you see today, are you able to compare those and are they comparable? Is it even cheaper in some respects in 2016 or is it more expensive? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, actually, I lived through that. It was the end of 2015 was the capitulation. Everyone had abandoned the sector and everyone was in a fetal position, it seemed. But at the time, gold price was much lower and the fundamentals of the company weren't where they are today. So from a value perspective, the companies are in such great financial shape today because we've had you know two or three years now of higher gold prices. A lot of these companies are net-net debt-free paying dividends, whereas back in 2015, they weren't. But in terms of sentiment and investor interest, that's why we find this so shocking is I would kind of parallel the two right now, especially given the drift we've gone into in the last two months in the gold equities. I'm absolutely convinced that when whatever the reason is, the narrative is, I'm I'm not sure if it's going to be a geopolitical or an economic or a fundamental realization of U.S. debt or, you know, Fed balance sheets, I'm not sure, or recognition of recession. But when people start looking at gold and gold equities, there's such a, a pocketism to the upside on a lot of these gold equities because they've just been drifting down, drifting down. And again, these algos have just been pressing these things down. When the algos decide to go the other way, 
you know, we could see a very significant pop in these stocks. And that's what we saw in the early, early 2016 when we came off the bottom. So what's different now is these companies are in much, much better financial shape. And I'm talking about the developers, producers, mid-tiers. The exploration companies, you know, they've advanced their projects, but they're running on ether in terms of cash right now. So they're not really doing much. But that'll create an, its own opportunity. Final question on the stocks. I, are you focused mostly just on the precious metals or do you, you know, uranium looks like it's broken out. It's getting pretty interesting over there. You know, you mentioned copper. Are you just focused on the precious metals or are you kind of buying across the board? You know what? I'm not uranium. I just, timelines on uranium stocks, um, I've just already gone there and there's not that many companies. But, you know, base metals, precious metals. I'm very, very, very bullish on, on copper. We've had some very big wins on copper. We were fortunate enough to be in Philo alongside the family and went um, $1.85 on the financing two and a half years ago. Now it trades at $21 a share. The supply side of copper is going to be a big, big, big problem going forward. I just think right now um, with China's slowdown and I really believe the data points now are still pointing to recession and that will create a dip in the equities and that will be the last buying opportunity because there's just no new copper mines coming into production. And so um, we're very bullish long term copper. It's just, you know, the stocks have stayed up quite high and yet copper's at 375. Gold stayed near its high and yet the stocks are traded down. So I think just the value proposition, the gold equities right now offer greater reward relative to the copper stocks. But I'm very bullish on both long term. Very interesting. So in a sense, from an investor viewpoint, the excitement is in the precious metal stocks from a valuation perspective. Fascinating. When I say excitement, excitement because nobody's paying attention. And so there's no excitement right now. I mean, copper is a, always a narrative, right? Because it's a um, now an EV metal, right? As, as Jeff Curry from Goldman Sachs referred to it a year ago, copper is the new oil. And so it's got a lot of attention. But in terms of where I think there could be some percentage moves that are very material, the gold equities, I think, because again, this U.S. dollars had a two-month bounce, and people have forgotten about the fact they, you know, thirty-two trillion dollar debt. And just on that note, with interest rates where they are, to put it in perspective, the interest payments on U.S. debt right now are equivalent to the entire but uh, military budget and medical budget, medical expenses in the United States. So think about that. So just the interest costs. It seems like things are coming to a head and in a sense, the kind of common ground between the precious metals and the debt is this idea of time. It seems like it's a matter of time and that the clock is running out, one would think. I mean, we keep thinking that and it keeps getting extended, the clock in a sense. But when you look at those charts of the interest payments, I think I just saw it yesterday on a, I think Luke Groman on a podcast there. And it was just like, it was stunning to see that chart. So kind of related to all these issues is we had the BRICS summit last week, and I want to get your thoughts on that. I mean, on in some respects, it felt kind of underwhelming. I mean, there was all this talk of a common currency beforehand and whatever that means, a settlement currency between central banks or whatever the case might be, gold may be playing a role. It seemed like it was a bit underwhelming, and I'm not sure how much to attribute to, frankly, the news reporting out in the West was maybe not excited to say how you know amazing of a conference it was. You kind of had to dig deep on it, but what were your thoughts of that BRICS summit? Well, it's interesting because there's all the buildup in you know some of the gold bugs about you know this common currency, reserve currency coming out, it's gold backing of some sort. I didn't think anything like that was going to happen. I think the underlying tone of what took place with the expansion, uh, adding six new members invited in that is effective January 1st, 2024, is more important than the lack of narrative. And, and I think the key point is, is that what you're seeing now is, is a group of countries that now control 40% of the population and increasing uh, GDP of the, of the global economy, basically standing up against the G7. And what and the real message about this de-dollarization is that they don't want to be beholden to the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. And so that's why people are speculating, you know, they, are they going to come with something or not? I didn't expect anything to come of it. But the key point is, is that what they're doing is they're drawing the attention that, you know, U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency is going to continue to be diluted down. And it's not being as used as it was 20 years ago. And you look at a situation, for example, I was just looking at the uh, Turkish uh, lira. 
And last year, when the U.S. dollar went up exponentially because of, of raising rates, it played havoc on them because a lot of their debt was denominated in U.S. dollars. So a lot of these countries have their debt denominated in U.S. dollars. And so to be beholden to a, a policy change in the United States that has an impact on their economics, I think what the BRIC message and the expansion of BRICS is, is that it's time that we just don't you know, accept the fact that the U.S. dollar is the only medium. And so over time, I'm not sure what comes out of it, but again, I think what you're seeing here is people more and more, these countries more and more, saying that you know we just don't want to be beholden to the U.S. dollar, and that's why, again, most people don't know this in the United States, but you know the Eastern Central Banks, a lot of these BRICS nations and that continue to buy gold, and they've been de-dollarizing. Now, what's the ultimate outcome out of this? I don't know, but it's definitely a message that you know the U.S. dollar as the only trading uh, instrument, I think is going to become less and less as these countries evolve their populations and their GDP. You know, I think it's a really interesting point you bring up on this whole idea that it's not just for sanctions that people want to de-dollarize, which is often the reason you hear it's okay, you know, by freezing the Russian assets. And that is a factor. Uh, but I think it's really interesting how you're bringing up just this idea, just this kind of dependence on the dollar where if there's just like a policy change on monetary policy at the Fed, all of a sudden Turkey has a massive issue and a ton of countries all of a sudden have a massive issue and that that in itself is a major cause for mm -hmm. this desire to, you know, to be independent financially, to be sovereign, so to speak. Well, and, you know, again, and behind the scenes, and uh, if I could just jump in, because I had a, a meeting um, uh, last Friday with Randy Smallwood, who's chair of the World Gold Council. And a lot of um, people listening you know, probably don't know of their initiative, but it's been two years in the making. It's called Gold 24-7. And if you look at Bitcoin, at what it did, I mean, it, it was a new currency that was created because it had no political attachment. It was a finite amount, no debt obligation, and you could do it. And it was independent of the political stewardship of these of these other currencies. And so it was birthed and now it's, it's embraced. And yet, if you really think of it, what's it backed by? Nothing. So the initiative that's taking place and, you know, we think it's going to be launched sometime in the new year, but, you know, and it's taken a while to put together, but you have to get the LBMA, the World Gold Council, you have to get all the bullion banks on side, you have to get the financial um, institutions on side. But what is coming down the pipe here is a gold-backed stable coin. So really, it's, it's, a, it's a blockchain or a crypto gold. And so you'll be able to buy that. And uh, when you buy that, it's sitting in a vault in England, Switzerland, Singapore, or Shanghai. And so what it is, it's basically, uh, not to parallel the two, but it's basically a, a Bitcoin, but it's a gold coin, but it's physical. And it's also very finite too. I mean, gold supply goes up by 2% a year. Yet US dollar just increased from four to 14 trillion in, in currency in three years. So it's very dilutive to US dollars. So I think, when this comes out, I think it's going to be a game changer. And I think what it does, it brings gold into the 21st century. And just to put it in perspective, when Bitcoin hit 18,000 and gold was still at 2,000, staying up, so it was proving its validity, one of the search engines in Google uh, amongst Bitcoin investors was, how do you buy gold? So hmm. they are an investor that are willing to shift. So if you own Bitcoin at $27,000 right now, all of a sudden, a uh, blockchain gold coin essence comes along and you can buy that and it is one of the top three reserve currencies in the world i ask will that be attractive i think it's going to bring gold into the 21st century and then you take it one step further if you're brick nations and this becomes basically a blockchain currency then why can you not trade in that opposed to us dollars that's forward thinking of course but just think about that because people are using bitcoin to trade around the world We've had actually Randy Smallwood on the program and he did actually share that initiative with us. And yeah, it was fascinating. And I mean, there are, I think I actually own, full disclosure, I, I own a Pax Gold, which is a crypto that does gold. But I mean, half the time you're wondering, oh, these guys are under investigation by the SEC for their stable coins. You know, so if you can get like the London Bullion Association or, you know, whatever 
you know, real official institutions, the World Gold Council, to back something like this, to kind of give it that social proof, so to speak. Yeah, I think there is definitely an opportunity well, and Adrian, that, there. And that's why this is taking so long, because you have to have all this in place. You know, because I don't know if you recall, but Trafigero, there was counterfeit nickel and there was a $500 million loss. Oh, yeah. It was just nickel plated. So when this comes out, I mean, you know that you own a 99.995 gold, whatever denomination that sits in a vault in England and it's yours, right? You know it's there. And that's, yeah. that has to be has to be put in place. And, and we're talking about something global here. I mean, this is, you know, Again, all they're doing now is bringing gold into the 21st century. And so, you know, again, I ask my U.S. investors, your assets are all in U.S. dollars, your your house, your investments, your, your cars, your savings accounts. And, you know, look at the U.S. dollar purchasing power o- over the last few years here. And so, you know, they've had it in hard assets. But if you could diversify out of U.S. dollars into, into another currency that has no political attachment, no debt obligation and no printing press, you know, gold is the alternative. And if it can get the narrative, and again, the, the key word there is narrative, because narrative economics is what drives stock flows these days. And if we can get the narrative towards the space, and then you get the gold miners that mine it. I mean, Coinbase is the, the gold standard of crypto mining, they call it. Well, what about the gold standard of gold companies who are miners of gold, whose market cap is less than Home Depot? I mean, the value proposition of these, of these companies is incredible. Yeah, and there does seem to be, you know, just wrapping up here, there does seem to be an inevitability of connecting blockchain to metals, even just for the ESG reasons, right? And Mm -hmm. I think we've already started to see this. So, yeah, it kind of feels like uh, an idea whose time has come. Do you have any final thoughts for us, Cam, as we kind of close out here, a big picture on uh, anything we haven't talked about that you think should be discussed? Going back to the metals and mining space, I think there's just such an underweighting of investor interest in the sectors that, you know, any slight shift can be very impactful on price movement. And quite honestly, I think once the price movement starts, it will attract a lot of investors because that's what tips off all the algos. You get these rate of change and, you know, you look at something like a Tesla, for example, in the first 15 minutes trading, it trades 10 million shares because all the algos on it, so it's all the indexes are on it. and yet. There'll be days on the gold stocks where it's like someone turned off a switch and there's no volume because there's no algos on them. So I think if we can get this narrative shift happening and people understand that, you know, gold is near its all time highs and yet no one's paying attention. I think there's a real potential for a a re-rate. And again, going back to this Bitcoin at 27,000 and gold at, let's say, 2000, with this 24-7 gold initiative coming out, you know, the, the debate about, okay, gold, Bitcoin, well, Gold has stood the test of time for 5,000 years, and what is the true value of gold? If you start looking at, you know, the fiat currencies printed over the last 30 years and the debt levels that have come along the world, you start looking at what gold's value could be. I mean, it could be materially higher than where it is. And so that debate could bring in a lot of price action. And so we'll see what happens. But, you know, as I said, it's the only currency in the world that has no political attachment and no debt obligation. And I'm sorry, but look what's politically happening in the world right now. And look at the debt levels of the world. People should be concerned about the fear currencies. And Accord Genuity Senior Investment Advisor, Cam Curry, thank you for joining us and sharing your insights once again on the Northern Miner podcast. Adrian, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. A big thank you to Cam Curry of Canaccord Genuity for joining us once again on the Northern Miner podcast. Also to Michael Connor, president and CEO of Vizsla Silver for sponsoring this week's episode. If you want to join us in London, simply go to events.northernminer.com. It should be a wonderful show. If you want to help out the podcast, please leave us a review in the Apple podcast directory. Share it with your friends. And until next week, take care.